I want to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. And even though we have a small group today, I appreciate you participating. Uh, this is our fourth panel in our conversation on um, diversity and data series. And this is a series that the Ecological Forecasting Initiative um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Working Group has been um, hosting. And so today we're talking about online tools that are useful for learning and teaching. And um, I don't think I mentioned before, my name is Jody Peters. I'm the program manager for the Ecological Forecasting Initiative, or EFI. So for today, um, I've got a little bit of an overview about EFI. Diana Delbon, who's the co-chair of our um, DEI group, will be introducing the panelists and um, helping with transitions between them. And thank you to Kaylin, Sam, and Amelia for um, being willing to talk to us today and participate and share your insights. We really appreciate your time. Alyssa Wilson will moderate our Q&A session at the end, and I'll go over how uh, we'll have you guys submit questions uh, in just a little bit. And then after an hour, we'll take a short break for people that need to jump off. Um, if you're available to continue to stay with us, we can follow up with any remaining questions and then open up for a, a larger um, discussion and brainstorming session um, talking about um, what the panelists have brought up. We'd ask you to please stay muted while um, the panelists are speaking so we didn't, don't interrupt them. Uh, I think most of you are sharing your video. It's nice to see your faces. If you prefer not to share your video, that's fine. Um, this is a family-friendly, pet-friendly workshop. We know everyone is working from home and um, people and pets may pop in and that's fine. So real quick, I wanted to give a little overview about EFI. Uh, EFI is a grassroots consortium. We're aimed at building and supporting an interdisciplinary community of practice around iterative near-term ecological forecasts. And iterative forecasts are a great tool for helping to provide management decisions and for testing ecological theory and the scientific method. So being able to come up with a hypothesis, um, collect data, for that hypothesis, test it out, and then as we collect new data, um, uh, assess that hypothesis and do it iteratively. So there's many different types of forecasts, but some examples could be uh, harmful algal blooms, forecasts for terrestrial carbon and water fluxes, or invasive species or commercial fish populations, things like tick-borne diseases. Those are all things that are for um, that can be forecasted. And if you go to our website, and Alyssa is going to help me put in some links in the chat. Um, on our website in the about section, we have a section that gives examples of forecasts. So you can see more details there. We also have links to a playlist about forecasting in general. Um, so that's a good resource as well if you are interested in learning more. So forecasting is an emerging approach and it provides an estimate of the future state of an ecological system and it includes the uncertainty about that prediction for the future state. So just like weather forecasts let us prepare for the future, ecological forecasts lets us prepare for future changes in ecosystem services. So in EFI, we are, um, we revolve around um, seven key cross-cutting working groups that apply to any type of ecological forecast. So whether it be marine forecasts, um, freshwater or terrestrial forecasts, um, theory and synthesis, thinking about social science or the cyber infrastructure and statistical methods, um, transferring the knowledge um, that we get from the forecast, thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, and education, all crosses any kind of forecast people may want to make. Um, we also have a student association and we have a Canadian chapter. And just last week, uh, we have an Australian chapter that was initiated. We also have NSF funding for a research coordination network. And the goal of that is to create this community of practice um, that builds capacity for creating ecological forecasts um, by leveraging NEON data products. So we have a NEON forecast challenge that's going on. This is the first year of that and will be going on for at least the next four years. 
Um, and again, you can go to our website to get more details about that. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was that we have some upcoming workshops. So on June 14 and 15, um, the Student Association is hosting a uh, meeting for early career people interested in forecasting. We have a meeting on June 7th that is for, uh, that will be focused on inclusive pedagogy and um, coming up with ideas about that and compiling resources. And then what comes out of that workshop is going to feed into our June 20 and 29 workshop, which is um, going to be focused on empowering the development of educational resources um, for forecasting. So now transitioning to get us ready for our panel, um, we'd like to collect questions for the panelists using Poll Everywhere. And I'm actually going to get out of this and see, can you guys see the Poll Everywhere webpage? So if you go to Poll ev.com slash EFI 2021. I think Alyssa will put that in the chat as well. That will bring up this question. It'll get you onto the platform. Um, and really right now, we just want to get you there and make sure that you're there. But we thought since we're talking about online tools and one of the things Alyssa's been working on and leading the past year is compiling educational resources that are useful for people interested in uh, learning forecasting. We wanted to pull the group to see if there's online educational resources that you have found work well. And it doesn't have to be for forecasting. It can be for any topic. Um, or uh, if nothing comes to mind right away for that, are there specific formats that you found have worked well, like videos, tutorials, or um, code repositories? So once you get to the website, go ahead and type something in. And um, so we've got hands-on modules that have come in. You can also see that there is this thumbs up button. So if that is something that uh, you have found worked well, you can do the thumbs up. Um, and so that will also be uh, something that you'll be able to do as people are posting questions for the panelists. You can uh, do a thumbs up for questions that you would like to have asked as well or enter your own questions. So we've got Prepackaged teaching modules, video tutorials, Cubes Hub website for the Quant Bio Online, um, hands on modules. So it looks like you guys are on the website, which is great. I'm going to stop my sharing. And um, yeah, so if you have any last thoughts about that question, go ahead and uh, ask it, but then as Kaylin starts to talk, I will switch this over to let you um, submit questions for her and then for all the other panelists as they continue to talk. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Diana. Good morning and um, welcome to all of our speakers. It's so great of you to spend your morning um, helping with this seminar. And um, we have really three um, incredibly expert speakers who are going to talk to us about online tools. And um, Sam Donovan is a science educator at the University of Pittsburgh. And he's working with um, the BioQuest Consortium and the CUBES Quantitative Undergraduate Biology Education and Synthesis. Both of those are um, places you can go for online learning. He's gonna tell us more about that. Kaylin Carey is an associate professor of Biological Sciences at Virginia Tech. And she's working with the uh, NSF funded Macrosystems Eddy Project, which collects um, modules for introducing undergraduate students to core concepts of macrosystems ecology and ecological forecasting. And then we are privileged to have Amiya Kusi with us, who's a graduate student, uh, master's in biology at Virginia Commonwealth University, soon to be moving to UMass as a PhD student. Um, and um, she's going to talk to us about her, her experience using open source tools in her research and um, her experiences with that. I think we're gonna start with um, Kaylin, move to Amelia, and then to Sam. Um, and Kaylin, if you'd like, you can go ahead and thank you. Oh, I did wanna say before I do that, we are creating here an open source tool, I would say, or a tool that for online learning. And so even though our audience is not very large, we're recording it. And I think that 
we can have this as a handy tool to use along with our others for introducing this topic. So thank you all for being here. Thanks, Diana. And I'm gonna share my screen. Um, and Jody and Diana asked me to put together just a few slides to introduce Macrosystems Eddy and Project Eddy. Um, and given how small of a group it is, I'd be totally fine if folks wanted to unmute or ask questions um, as we go through. So the overarching motivation of my work as an educator is to try to help students be equipped with the quantitative skills that they need both because of an ever-changing job landscape, but also because we need students kind of in this all hands on deck moment um, to be able to tackle the pressing environmental problems we face as a society. The problem that I experience, which I'm sure is not unique, is that I commonly have students have a very strong positive relationship between how much data they have or computational skills or online kind of tools and a very strong relationship with confusion. And so in response to this challenge, um, a group of educator and ecologist colleagues and I formed Project EDI in 2012. EDI stands for Environmental Data Driven Inquiry and Exploration, which is a collaboration between a whole different range of environmental science disciplines and pedagogical researchers to develop teaching modules that get real messy environmental data into the hands of undergrads to teach them fundamental concepts as well as computational and quantitative literacy skills. There's two kind of major efforts that are still continuing under the Project EDI umbrella from the first grant that was funded in 2012, EDI Earth and Ecosystems, which focuses primarily on kind of the earth sciences, and EDI Macrosystems, which I lead and I'll be focusing mostly on today. ProjectEDI.org hosts all of the modules, regardless of which funded effort they came from. Um, if you go to HTTP, ProjectEDI.org, you'll find our teaching materials. There's a whole range of modules that come prepackaged and focus on different concepts that you can um, kind of tailor for whatever appropriate classroom um, you're looking for. Regardless of which module that you find, um, each is aimed for about a three hour lab period as kind of a standalone lesson. Um, within a module, you'll find an instructor lesson plan, a PowerPoint that aims for about 10, 20 minutes to introduce the subject to the students pre-class readings, which are optional, but could help to build context for upper level students, in-class data analysis activities and the data sets to do them, um, homework and answers and discussion questions. And kind of the, the mov motivation, and the learning objectives of these um, are really building skills, but using kind of not cookie cutter labs, but having students work with real data sets, um, both building kind of the concept side, but also the skill side. My job as kind of the lead of Macrosystems Eddy is to help build students' understanding about the complexity of ecology, ecological systems, and how systems are responding to global change. Um, this is targeted more at upper level undergraduate students, but we still have our modules taught in intro classes. And students are working specifically with different levels and kind of a complexity of ecosystem models. And all of our modules are taught within the R statistical learning environment. We are recently adding in Shiny apps to generate ecological forecasts, which students themselves are generating forecasts within the app and through R, which is a new addition on this project. And I have to give a special shout out um, to the three awesome postdocs that have helped me do this, uh, Kate Farrell, Alex Anshell, and Ty Moore, um, who are instrumental in making this work. We use the 4DEE, the Four Dimensions Ecological or Ecology Education Framework as one of our pedagogical framings for our, our modules. This is the, the pedagogical framework that has been endorsed by the Ecological Society of America, in which we have core ecology concepts, cross-cutting themes, human dimensions, as well as embedded science practices, which underlie all of our modules. Specifically, the ones that we're focusing on here today are kind of our programming, modeling, and ecological forecasting. I think an important part of the EDI program is that any module that you can find on our website has been rigorously tested and vetted across a range of classrooms that kind of span the Carnegie classifications from Hispanic serving associates colleges to R1s, small upper level kind of undergraduate classes to intro courses that have hundreds of students. Um, we have specifically assessed and targeted classes at about 30 different universities, both in the US and in other countries, 
Um, we've kind of over about a thousand uh, student assessment data, which has been used to advise, revise kind of and iteratively improve our modules to make them as broadly accessible as possible. A common finding across all of our modules is that this, they increase students' proficiency and confidence. And I think that's a really important part um, of building confidence is, is a really important goal of our modules. And I think especially relevant to some of the, the group and kind of thinking about um, making kind of using uh, modules such as these as an equalizer in classrooms is that one of the other consistent findings we find across all these assessment results is that the students with the most to gain will gain the most and that the students who initially report the lowest level of knowledge or proficiency or confidence with computational skills or working with data exhibit the largest gains after completing a module. And again, these are just short term responses from pre post assessments, but I think that it is a really important indication that for in terms of thinking about having classes with a diversity of experiences that modules such as these can help kind of rise the tide for all boats. Um, and we see this kind of both for modeling, you know, macro systems ecology, but also in terms of systems thinking skills, which is something that I think we're always trying to build as educators. We've been thinking a lot about how well our modules work since we've all kind of pivoted to remote learning. Um, and so I assessed this specifically last fall in which we um, had students compete, complete a module using synchronous virtual format and compared them um, with students from the same institution and the same course the preceding year who had done the module in face-to-face -face instruction. And I think what something that was um, really important to us is that we saw really similar gains. There's no significant differences between the virtual format and the face to face students in terms of proficiency working with R or ecological concepts. And interestingly, we actually saw a greater gain for the students that did this virtually in terms of those who said that they would be more interested in using R, our studio, our studio cloud in the future, um, which up to 81% was really kind of um, exciting for us to see. So part of my prompt was to tell um, a little bit about the lessons learned from over a decade of working on this project. Um, and some of these are articulated in a paper that Kate Farrell and I wrote, um, which is published in Ecology and Evolution as an open access paper. And I'd be happy to share with folks after. Um, but some of the common themes that we've seen in terms of developing online tools is that the intimidation barrier to working with new software is really high. Um, which I think that this figure illustrates um, really powerfully and that time spent on the X axis and skill um, for R especially has a connotation of, oh my goodness, what am I doing? And I think something that's important to note with this um, is that students recognize that this is challenging and they initially will have really low proficiency and confidence working with R or programming. Um, these are data here from pre-module um, students on the y axis here is Likert values of least to most, so lowest proficiency, low confidence in both R and programming um, prior to completing a module. But they know that they will likely need to be able to use this kind of skills later on. So they know that this is important. It's just helping them to get them started. And so some solutions to tackling that are in terms of assuming no prior knowledge of kind of computational tools or skills going into this with a fresh slate um, to decrease the intimidation barrier. Um, rather than having students write their own code to do something, we give them pre um, kind of code that's already written, but with very uh, kind of um, well annotated parts that they have to modify. Um, and so having them have some a starting place and know where very clear instructions about where to make changes is a lot easier for them to get started on than having them open up a blank script and having them have to write their own code from scratch. The second part of this is making it into a real world experience. So emphasizing that these are real data collected from real ecosystems that they're working with. Um, you know, I work a lot on kind of as a freshwater ecologist and talking about water quality, drinking water, making the tasks that they're doing in a way that they can understand its importance is really important. Um, and also, I think that there's an important role for thinking about empathy on the part of the instructor of that the risk of failure is really high. Um, so patience and understanding is critical and being able to pivot to, to adapt to a student's experience level is really important as well, as many of you know, well know. A second challenge um, that I experience a lot is this expectation of that our undergraduates are digital natives um, and that they have grown up with phones and internet in ways that 
we have not always had in the past. Um, and so there's this expectation that students should be able to handle any kind of software or online tools. Um, and I think it's really important to note that students' experiences are actually really different. Um, and we've had kind of classrooms where students have never really worked with computers or software before attempting a module. And so ways that we can work to overcome this is working with partners. So all of our modules are set up so that there are two students working together in teams. Um, and then having the students work as kind of near peer helpers. So once a pair finishes an activity, they have to make sure all the other pairs um, are, are up kind of finished as well before they can move on to the next task. We have kind of worksheets as well as discussion questions to check in so that students don't just run code and let it go, but actually have to answer embedded questions before they can progress to the next activity. And then I think this is also kind of important on the side of the instructor of just staying engaged throughout a lesson plan, um, whether that's moving between Zoom breakout rooms or just interrupting students and checking in in a face-to-face -face setting. The third pitfall um, that we've experienced a lot is this trouble with troubleshooting um, and that many students due to kind of the appification of many tools don't really see error messages. So when they're running an R script and get a red kind of scary note that their code didn't run, it can be really almost traumatizing and they don't know how to handle that. Um, and so one way in which we try to over help them overcome this is give them a guide where they see what errors look like a priori. Um, and common ways of overcoming them. For example, something we often experience is issues with working directories. Um, and so having students kind of see what an error message would look like and how best to fix that gives them the tools for them to be able to resolve the problems themselves. And then something that we've also seen is that, you know, not every student has their own laptop. So having um, computer labs that are common for an instructor to use um, is really important for streamlining troubleshooting as well as giving students kind of a broader access to our materials. The last um, pitfall that we see is that instructors are also intimidated. And that's something that's really important to note is that we're asking instructors to teach skills that they may not have learned themselves. And if they don't have the comfort or experience working with these skills, it can be really scary in the classroom when you're trying to troubleshoot or help students if you don't know what to do yourself. Um, and so our kind of way of trying to overcome this is helping faculty that don't have any prior experience with modeling or forecasting or R um, is to have them go through a module on their own. Um, and then we work very closely with faculty that are interested um, to make sure that they feel confident in the classroom. Um, we have that be where we show them which parts of the lesson plan can be adapted for their own use based off of what their students needs are or the curriculum. And we also run workshops where we train instructors to, to become more confident and to know exactly how to use modules themselves, um, which has been really interesting because then we've seen them transfer some of those skills over to their research programs. Um, so I'm just as a final note, as I'm wrapping up, um, if you're interested in learning more about our modules, um, macrosystemsedu.org hosts all of them, projectedu.org hosts the other modules. We're actually right now running and developing new modules where we're looking for, for classrooms to test on our materials. So if you're interested in this, please reach out to me. Um, together, I think my hope is, is that our, our modules can increase um, students' quantitative literacy and confidence so that rather than having confusion, we're hopefully building excitement. Um, and so with that, I just wanna thank again, the organizers of this panel, our funding from NSF and all of our fabulous testers and students um, without which none of this would be possible. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kaylin. And I think we're gonna hold our questions, um, but uh, I'm gonna launch Amelia now and um, then at the end we'll do questions, okay? All right, Amelia. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so this picture, probably you all have seen it already. Um, my name is Emilia Obodumkusi, and I am so excited to be here to deliver this presentation. And also to add that I am from Ghana in West Africa. Um, so yeah, so my thesis work has been a product of how online tools work well for um, remote learning and research. I currently work on modeling the effects of climate, host plants, and natural enemies, specifically parasitoids, on the distribution of insect pests. 
And the inset pairs that I am specifically focusing on are the Menduka sister and Menduka quinca maculata, which is the tomato hornworm and the tobacco hornworm. They especially feed on plants in the Solinaceae family, which includes tomato, tobacco, um, peppers, and other crops. And so I'm looking at their distributional changes as well and how they have spread through from um, 1970 to the present, um, the present um, year. So all these, all these um, study and the data that I used for this work were from citizen science data. So no field work, which means a lot for a COVID season. Um, <laughs> yeah, and this work is also co-advised by the Holshoff and Kester Lab here at VCU. And Dr. Catherine Holshoff is a data scientist and a macroecologist at VCU. Um, okay. Yeah. So it's a data scientist and a macroecologist here at VCU. And that is where I got my training in data science from. And Dr. Kester is also a wonderful entomologist. So having these great experts on board has been a great um, privilege for me. Okay. So I brought this up here um, based on the fact that this, this particular program is hosted by the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Working Group of the Ecological Forecasting Initiative. And I can say that we completely need more of this. The world is such a big place. And particularly for science with a lot of unanswered questions, we can only address these issues through an integrated effort and supporting the different background expertise and our inputs to science. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about COVID before I add to how important it is to use open source data. Um, with COVID, probably a few of us or a lot of us were restricted in our movements, um, even to failed sites and research areas. And according to UNESCO, it said, it reported that over 376 million students worldwide were impacted by the pandemic. And there were lots of research articles that were released to support this statement. So in a sense, it could be said that research is probably harder um, and education is getting harder than we thought. But then it, that is when um, online tools is a lot more helpful to students and professionals in the research field to be able to work on their research, even from the comfort of their homes. So the Holshoff Lab, which is held by um, Dr. Catherine Holshoff here at VCU, we focus on three major um, goals, which is data science and tools, where we use openly available data and software packages to run models and simulations for the research studies that are aimed on measuring, predicting, um, spatial, both spatial and temporal and biological variances. And even also to discover the drivers of biodiversity, like my research is focusing on how um, to identify the climate variables or biotic variables that impact the distribution of the insect pests. So using data science has um, been a great, um, using open source tools and data science has been a major part of this lab. Um, and another, another goal that we focus on to is the culture of collaboration. Um, and in previous time, the lab has collaborated with Mion and, uh, um, and Data Carpentry in organizing workshops for students to train them and also to um, work with open source data and answer some biological questions. And the last one too we do is diversity and creativity. And um, the, the Holshoff Lab right now, which is um, which we have our PI to be Dr. Catherine Holshoff, is steering the diversity, equity, and inclusion group here at VCU. And also we constantly work on developing new strategies to increase um, diversity, equity, and inclusion in the department. Okay, so I'll share a little bit about my research and how the transition has been for me. In undergrad, it was all field work. And along with two other colleagues of mine, we sampled over, 
over 3,000 insects from different um, orders and to assess macro invertebrates and vegetation association on a riparian corridor. The challenge with that was even after gathering all the data we needed, most of these insects we collected had to be disposed due to the unavailability of storage equipment. And that could be one of the many challenges we can all face with, um, even with field work and all of that. But presently for my master's study, I am using citizen science data, which automatically saved me from the, the fact that I would need to preserve um, the 10,000 presence records that I have right now, if those were to be filled data. Um, so, and I have the privilege to even collect as many occurrence records that are available on citizen science, um, that are available as open source data. And yeah, to use them for my research. The only issue that could be related to that is that it, have to, it has to go through intense data cleaning, which is, which is absolutely feasible. Um, yeah, so I would add that um, most research take three major stages. The first one is having your data and then also knowing the statistical analysis that you can perform with the data. And through that, either you would predict um, the distribution of the species that you are looking at or measure the importance of the drivers you are looking at for your work. So all of these stages of research are, um, are, are very possible to do from the open source and online um, remote learning. So a couple of sites that I got my data from include the GBEF, Neon, um, USDA, which is the United States Department of Agriculture. That is where I, I collected um, the, um, the data on the host plants that I am looking at and also validated some of these records from the CABI sites and also took the climate variable, um, the data for the climate variables from World Climb. And NASA is also a very good um, source, as well as the EDIG bio. So all these sites have open source data that are available for, um, for students and researchers to access the data here and also to use with their, in their research. Okay. So I also have here a couple of trainings that I took um, on YouTube. <laughs> and that include, the first one is the one that has the um, town, town said Peterson. And the, the creator of this YouTube channel is also the person that built um, one of the most used packages alongside with um, with one co-author, which is the bio mode package. And so with the, on the channel, they explain how to use the packages, which you employ them in the software package, um, software R, R studio, and also, op and also give codes on how to run them and troubleshoot um, whatever issues you might also be having. And the bioinformatic YouTube channel also is built by Babak Nayami, who is the, um, who also builds the package, um, who also builds, who also build the package um, SDM. And they have the, the upload videos that have codes on them and you can assess these codes and use them for your work. And we also have the um, Project Biodiversity Group, which um, is, is steered by Dr. Marjorie Weber from Michigan State University. It's a, it's a site that is still under development or recently that was developed together with her and a few students in her lab. And it's also a very good valu valuable um, tool for remote learning. And also the SDMR package Google Group um, this has been an incredible tool for me, particularly if I am getting um, 
cause problems with my coding and all of that. You send an email to a group that has a lot of experts, our experts and coding experts there, and you have people to answer whatever questions that you're having with your code. And there are also free code um, sites that you can uh, um, watch videos and get training. Um, Killing was talking about how difficult and frustrating it can be when your code is not working. And all these resources are very good tools that you can use and get clarification if you're having any difficulties. And the, the last one is also my channel that I am is still under build, I'm, I'm, I'm still building and I, I upload videos, the tutorials on um, calls that I'm using and I've come across. And GitHub as well, a place that you can get calls, um, free, free open accessible calls to do your research. So with, with all of these um, trainings and packages you are using, you are likely to perform a lot of analysis um, on your work, beginning from um, developing threshold maps, maps that can help you can help you look at the um, the the way the distribution of the species is likely to go in the next fifty years. Um, so we have the threshold map, the occurrence maps, um, the ecological niche maps, where you can look at um, two variables and how they affect the distribution of your species, and also how they um, how they support or or the species, the species distribution respond to these two variables, predictor variables, and also the various, um, the, the response curve, the relative variable importance um, curves, plots. So all these are parts, some of the many analysis that you can run on your model, all from um, open source data and um, the software packages and trainings that are available on, online. Okay, so this will bring me to the end of uh, my presentation, and I look forward to any questions that um, you might have regarding this. Thank you so much, Amelia. Yeah, and sorry for the background. <laughs> no, it was completely not expected. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's great. And um, Sam, if you would like to go ahead, and then um, we'll have our Q&A afterwards. That sounds great. I'll get my screen shared here. And rearrange my desktop a little bit. Okay, good afternoon. And, and thank you very much uh, for this invitation. Uh, really important discussions going on right now about how to provide access and uh, even more importantly, equitable access to, to learning resources. And so uh, I chose to focus a little bit on open publishing, uh, which is a core piece of this CUBES project that I'll describe in just a moment. Um, because uh, I think that open publishing, uh, along with open science and open data, uh, is uh, beginning to be leveraged to empower faculty to do real scholarship and um, leads to more flexibility in terms of teaching and learning. So, oops, let's see if I can make this advance. There we go. So uh, CUBES is uh, an acronym for an NSF funded project called uh, Quantitative Undergraduate Biology Education and Synthesis. It's been going on for about seven years now. We're transitioning out of our NSF funding and coming under the wing of the nonprofit educational organization BioQuest. And so CUBES will persist. It, it's really a, a cyber infrastructure project. So it's designed to help the community of biology educators continue to sharpen their skills and uh, develop their own resources and understanding. And um, I, I'm just going to put in a quick pitch here where uh, this is our homepage or a screenshot of our homepage. And we are currently recruiting for our summer institute. It's going to be the second year that it's online. Uh, but we run a, 
a couple of weeks of uh, talks and posters and things in the summer, and then working groups form and uh, persist through the fall. So we're really about doing the work of teaching and supporting faculty as they are, are doing that. And we are also uh, attempting to uh, provide infrastructure for small education projects, right? So the uh, EFI has an RCN uh, support from NSF. Well, CUBES hosts about 14 RCN uh, UBE grants, which are undergraduate biology education RCNs. And so these are, you know, they're not big budgets and these projects need a place to get up and running uh, to create a public face, to share their resources, to um, reach out to the community. And so what we're trying to do is to break down the barriers between those innovators who are out building new things like the wonderful Eddie project and the, um, the people in classrooms who might actually pick those up and use them. And in fact, we've collaborated with Eddie a couple of times and really benefit from that. Okay, so I wanna focus on this open education resource model. We have a publishing system that is Git-like in the sense that it's got good version and uh, forking options. We don't call it forking because most of the faculty we work with aren't comfortable with that language. We call them adaptations. Um, and the key here is, uh, well, a couple of different things. Um, Open educational resources have been cited from many perspectives as uh, increasing access to educational resources, primarily for price reasons, right? You can get your hands on these things without paying uh, publishing fees. And um, it's a very important aspect of open education resources uh, being free to use. But we think that even more importantly, there's a culture around open education, publishing, and teaching practices. So lots of people say OER, but we are also pushing OEP, open education practices. What can you do when you have access to these materials and permission to modify them, customize them for your student audience, um, you know, bring in your own data set, all these sorts of things. And when we started seven years ago, we got a lot of pushback from faculty because there's this sort of schism, as I'm sure many of you know, that most biology faculty are evaluated primarily on their research output, but we have this growing cadre of teaching specialists and there are lots of institutions where people have massive teaching loads and yet there were very few sort of professional outlets for educators. And so we've made it central to our mission to sort of increase the visibility of teaching scholarship and allow people to gain credit for that. But we got a lot of pushback about, well, where's the peer review or where's the quality control? And uh, it, it's a different perspective, right? In an open education publishing environment, you're not putting the um, filter up front. You're, people publish things and share them and tag them, and then they get adopted and adapted and used, which raises up the visibility of those things that the community is celebrating and developing further. So it's a different kind of filtering system. Um, so we have this platform for publishing, open education resources. We have thousands of, of materials that have been submitted. Um, and what we're able to do is uh, coordinate projects, uh, publications, so that they're able to document what they're, uh, what they're producing. We also do a lot with open source tools, and we host things like RStudio and a variety of other computational environments, including uh, computational notebooks. Um, so we're open all the way. <laughs> so what happens when you uh, share your educational resources on cubes is that they become part of this large active library. And so we really fought against 
a repository model. The idea that you publish something and it's finished and it's locked away. It, well, you publish something on cubes, it is there and it will never go away, but it can be picked up and versioned or uh, customized. And so we have a system where every publication gets a, a digital object identifier. We track usage metrics. We have a variety of ways to make uh, the resources visible and engage user communities. Um, we run a lot of professional development programs that are essentially chances to train faculty to use teaching materials and help them customize those materials and republish them. And what we find is that uh, it's opening up the conversation about teaching, right? We're, we're able to discuss we're always making compromises, right? We have to make hard choices. And we can see in these sort of constellation of different versions of things that are appearing, some of the strategies that teachers are using, and then we can adapt and adopt those strategies as well as the specific materials that they've developed. So that's been very interesting. And then, as I mentioned, in addition to uh, helping individual faculty we really are pushing to support projects uh, in getting up and running quickly and taking a more community-based collaborative approach to their work. All right, I'm gonna keep this fairly brief here. In response to going online about a year ago, we uh, launched another little initiative called Teaching Quantitative Biology Online, where we tried to um, not just provide raw resources, but provide support for using resources. And so you'll see here, um, we have resources, but we have office hours and we have walkthroughs on resources. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of uh, examples of what that looks like. And um, then I'd be happy to take any kinds of questions. So, um, you mentioned Amelia uh, I dig bio, one of our favorite collaborators. They uh, work through a group called Blue Biodiversity Literacy. And um, so their resources are data rich and uh, very well written out and organized. And so this is one of a couple of dozen projects that you can jump to their resources through the Teaching Quantitative Biology Online group trying to cluster them. In terms of office hours, well, here's an IDIG bio person, Molly Phillips, who uh, led some office hours. We are not currently doing this anymore. Uh, this was pretty useful early on, but um, we really felt like teachers needed a place to talk to each other. They needed a place to talk about their teaching. And uh, you know, this uh, adjustment that we made was pretty dramatic. So another way, that we pushed to increase the discussion around resources and not just giving people uh, long lists of resources is we uh, recorded short introductions to resources with the authors and a couple of users. And we would just do it off the cuff, no script uh, on a Zoom call and edit it down to 10 or 15 minutes and we found that these were very successful in helping faculty evaluate whether they wanted to use a resource in their classroom or not. So here's one example on a quantitative literacy project uh, called Figure of the Week, where you ask students to look at data representations and uh, have discussions about what's, what's good and bad about those representations and how they can be interpreted. So, Cubes uh, is a huge uh, collaborative effort with faculty at William and Mary and Radford University and Bates College and North Carolina State. And uh, we appreciate our NSF funding and our Hewlett funding. And uh, I hope that we'll have the opportunity to have some discussion and please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. That was great. And I am going to turn it over. I think Alyssa is doing the questions today. 
And Alyssa, before you start, since we're at five minutes to two, I think we'll just keep going and we're a small group. So if you have to jump off, whenever you have to jump off, go ahead and um, yeah, but we don't need to have a short break or anything. So we'll just get going. Great. Thanks to all three of the panelists today. Um, I understand that Kaylin um, has a conflict starting at two, I think. Okay. Um, I'm good till 2.15. So. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, I'm still going to start with a question for you just to make sure that we get it in. It was one of our um, upvoted questions. So I, one of the questions is, do you think that the Eddy modules can be used um, outside the classroom or independently by students? And are there specific concerns or like ways that you've thought about um, adapting the modules for that kind of use? Yeah, um, I think this is a great question because um, we want our modules to be used by not just in the classroom setting. Um, and so some examples that I know, I'm aware of are um, we have taught uh, modules at conference workshops. Um, there is a, a scientific work, two scientific working groups that we have partnered with um, where we've actually used the modules as kind of an education tool for getting all um, uh, researchers um, up to speed on a certain modeling technique that we taught in the module for undergrads, but many kind of grad students and faculty hadn't been experienced with that as well. Um, and so we actually kind of took out some of the intro material from um, one of our modules and essentially used that to teach um, lake ecosystem simulation modeling and kind of added additional materials onto that. Um, so I feel like they're definitely adaptable. Um, and one of the things that we've also seen is that we've because all of our the Eddy modules have an ABC activity structure where A is kind of the most intro, um, B kind of um, in between, and then C it could be added on as extra or as a homework for an intro level class, or you could potentially start with B and have A be a pre homework. Um, you could really adapt those. So I feel like that's kind of a really um, important part of the structure, which allows it to be used. Um, we've in kind of high school classrooms, which this is now part of the, uh, we've been partnered with educators in Kansas to meet some of their standards. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that answers that folks have questions um, regarding that. And if someone who asked that specifically, I could follow up too, if that didn't answer it. I think that was a great answer. It sounds like, yeah, the adaptability seems to be the important component there. Thanks. Um, I'm going to combine a couple questions that seem pretty similar. Um, so it, a lot of questions ask things about how, as educators, we can prepare students to look for resources themselves, whether that's um, how to look up functions in R, um, which is something I think that came in during uh, Kaylin's talk, or whether that is finding resources like the ones that you did, Amelia, to help your own research. How can we actually give students the skills to find their own resources? Um, I guess I'll open it up for Amelia, maybe if you have an answer first, and then we can hear from Sam and Kaylin. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. So I would say that getting the background introduction to how to use um, the software package that you would be running, the codes that you would get or all, all the trainings that you get on is the first um, thing that we would need to help students out with. Um, I was fortunate to have a very good um, background training in R. So that gave me that um, excitement to look for, look out for more um, trainings and codes and all of that. Um, and there are a lot of resources out there. Um, even for YouTube, I found out that there, there were great videos, tutorials um, that were extremely helpful to what I was working on. And yeah, so I'll say that the, the resources are out there. So if the student um, would also um, try to look out for these resources and connect with um, other professionals or in the in the in the research field and all these Google groups too are great ways that you can ask questions if you are coding and you come across any problems. Um, so yeah, I'll say the first thing is having 
having um, the background to how to use the package. Uh, you know, if you are using our studio and you don't know how to use a package, it even frustrates you from going <laughs> further to look for any training. So that would be the first thing that we can offer to um, students. Thanks, Amelia. Sam or Kaylin, do you have anything to add in training students to do their own research? <laughs> Yeah, I'll jump in and, and give a couple of uh, tricks that I use. So I teach both large introductory courses and some advanced <clears throat> smaller seminar style courses and advanced topics. And in both cases, I think it's really essential that we model the uh, capacity for building our own skills. And so it's exposing yourself a little bit in an appropriate way to students uh, that, that you're constantly having to look something up or you've got a cheat sheet that helps you remember the syntax for a particular call. And without, if we hide that, if we position ourselves as experts and um, don't display all the work that goes into maintaining our expertise, then I think we're cheating students um, and giving them a false sense of the goals. So it's, it's a very broad statement. I, I love that, Sam, and I think that is really important for setting, like is establishing the norms in a classroom setting and also um, something that we've done that kind of builds on that is explicitly having a, a homework that's early on or an assignment where students have to um, find through Stack Overflow or through some forum, um, some tool or some call or command to figure something out and really kind of talking through how best to empower them to do that independently and that this is a part of the learning process and there's nothing wrong and to normalize that it is okay to seek help um, I think is, is like a critical part of at least and, and we talk about that all the time too so yeah that's also been my experience um, I learned R and statistics not from any classroom or anything so trying to teach that myself in the classroom has been a real challenge for me um, because my um, inclination is just to say Google it <laughs> and we need to like learn how to use those skills and figure it out but a lot of students get really nervous about that so it's good to hear that just trying early on to get students to Google and figure things out is a good approach that's been successful for you guys. Anna did you have something you wanted to say? Sorry. I was just going to say for me when I figured out how to understand what the like stack overflow meant that was when i could could actually learn on my own and it was the weird vocabulary that i really struggled with so things like what the heck is a vector i don't know what a vector is and it was thrown out there like you know like the word chocolate like everyone knows what chocolate is so why would you not know what a vector is and when i would it, that not knowing the vocabulary also made it hard to put in the correct search terms into Google. Um, and I think what helped was when I started learning with somebody who was kind of at my same level. And so we could talk back and forth about how to get the correct words and figure out what these words, yeah, near peer mentoring, exactly, Kaylin, um, to, um, to figure out what these words were. And then I didn't feel stupid. Like I oftentimes when you're working with somebody who's way farther ahead of you, you just feel dumb and you don't want to ask questions or there's that intimidation factor. Um, but really for me, it was the vocabulary that was the biggest problem at the get-go to being able to learn it independently and search for those resources. <laughs> Yeah, definitely agree with that, Anna. Um, I want to say before I keep asking questions, because I'm happy to do that for the next half hour, but if other people have questions or anything, feel free to just um, stop me <laughs> from um, asking questions on the poll everywhere. Um, but with that said, there were a couple questions, I think mostly directed towards Kaylin and Sam about how we can um, continue to incorporate new data or the like newest research um, into our modules and make sure that they're not static. Yeah, I maybe mean, can start and then maybe Sam 
can jump in. So I think this depends a bit on the Eddy module that you work with. So some of them are specifically geared towards intro classes where, and we try to build them and we have um, at the outset of when you're looking at which module is a good fit for your class information on the context for use. So whether it's, it's for a one hour lecture period or if it's more appropriate for like a three hour lab. Um, and so for some of the intro ones, we actually have package data sets that are available with the module themselves. Um, and those are obviously static, but then in other modules, we have the students download the data from public repositories, whether it's, you know, going to the USGS um, water quality portal or downloading data from NEON or whatnot. And um, that's actually part of the module itself is the activity of students looking and downloading data. Um, and that's how we, I feel like, and for some of the modules, we have both together, where if you're have really limited time and you don't have the ability to do that in your class, so you, you just work with the, the prepared Excel or spreadsheet file, or if you have a kind of more time for your students where they, and you want them to explore the data and do the downloads themselves, they could do that option. So I think um, we are trying to balance both needs of practicality, but also that's an important skill themselves. And I don't know, Sam, I'm sure you've thought about this a lot too for Cube's materials. Yeah, thanks, Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin. <clears throat> the, I, I like the idea of, of helping the students pull the latest data or, or uh, pick up a new tool. We really sort of focus on faculty primarily. Um, and, you know, it sounds like a, a pitch, but the open publishing makes it possible for that to happen fairly easily. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. And I'll just give one example. Uh, a woman named uh, Kellen Callender published a module as part of TIEE, an ESA-sponsored investigations in ecology uh, curriculum project called Investigating the Footprint of Climate Change on Phenology and Ecological Interactions in North Central North America. And it was around Ohio. Uh, plants, basically, looking at distributions of Ohio plants. And so that module has been uh, adapted uh, 15 or 16 times as faculty picked it up and brought it to their state, right? They've localized it. And so it was never, I mean, uh, it was originally published in Thai probably a, a dozen years ago. So now people have written pieces of it in R, right? So you, it's a little bit of mix and match. It's a lot of work faculty have to invest in it but the capacity for incorporating new tools and new data are uh, sort of fundamental to open publishing and just to follow up on that because that's something we've been talking a lot about in eddie um is the ability to take materials and then translate them into other languages too is i think an important part of that of basically providing the platform for folks to um to make a, a useful locally and then to be able to reshare those materials so that someone doesn't have to go through the, the effort of translating into Spanish or Russian or whatever. So. Yeah, I think that's interesting. So I've been hearing some uh, like contradictions or, or maybe some cons of having open science in, a, in these availability of things to people who have uh, computational resources and that it might actually increase the gap between who is available to do the science and have access to these resources and who isn't. And so I feel like one of the simplest, uh, and even though translating is not always simple, but it's one of the first things and I think easiest low hanging fruit things that we can do to, um, to to not have that be a bad side effect of, of open science. And I, as you guys were talking about that, and as, um, and, and as each of the panelists was talking, it reminded me of what we heard from Antoinette in our first panel about students not having the, the computational, having computers to work on, or Christian in our uh, second panel about the importance of translating things into Spanish. Um, and so this really connects well. And it also, Kayla, when you were talking about students are coming in and we can't expect them to have these computer skills or, or yes, uh, I found myself with the students that we 
that I worked with here being surprised at, you know, their lack of knowledge of about just using their computers. Um, you know, they have their own computers, but they, they don't know where to put things in directories. And, and uh, so I think just keeping that in mind and maybe taking a step back is something to uh, keep considering. So I appreciated that. I kind of found the same thing in my REU is that it was helpful to start in the orientation, just talking about how to use Google Calendar, how do you use Zoom? How do you use all of these tools for online collaboration, you know? And the students did not have the skills a year ago. Maybe by now they do, I don't know. But even Google Drive is a very big mystery if you haven't used it yet. Google Drive is a big mystery, even if you've used it for years in my experience, I still lose things all the time. Um, but yeah, that's a really good point. I have also been surprised um, by the lack of um, familiarity, I guess, with um, computers and the resources that are already available for students from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, it's, so it's definitely an important first step. Yeah. Um, I'll, add, I'll add to it that also encouraging sharing um, like among the students too is great, um, especially when it comes to coding. Um, yeah, sometimes even you, you have the code right, but you're missing maybe a dot or something. So like, but if you are working in a collaborative way with other students, it's easy to fish out some of the errors you might have. Um, so encouraging, like sharing among students and allowing them to work in groups too, it's, I have found that to be very helpful too. Yeah, I, I'll give an example that I'm still sort of torn about. So in teaching an ecology course, an ecology lab, students are doing the work in groups. Uh, and we did a lot with dry labs this year. And they were working with data sets and, you know, doing some cleaning and, and uh, exploration and, and uh, analysis. And I chose to allow them to specialize, right? So some students could be the code specialist and some students could do the background research, whatever. I, I really gave it to them as a group project. And I think that's realistic in terms of the real world where these students will be in five years. But I'm really you know, disappointed that some of them left without running their own R scripts. And I think there's a missed opportunity. So I'm, I'm still torn about whether you treat them as tr truly collaborative groups or whether they're in a group, but everybody's supposed to reach some threshold. I had a um, something similar when I was doing some online learning as, as the learner in that there was some like R script that I was trying to figure out how to run and I just couldn't figure it out. And um, what I wanted was like a um, an answer key, right? Like, just tell me how to do it at this point, like, so that we can move on. Um, because at some point there's this like struggle between, am I misunderstanding the concept or am I just coding it wrong? And I don't know. And can you just give me the answer? But the instructor didn't want to give the answer for you know obvious reasons as an instructor, you don't want to just tell the student the, the answer, but that was a really difficult balance to come to. Um, so I like, I hear what you're saying, Sam, where it's just like, uh, I don't, I don't know how to deal with this. Cause as the learner at that point, I just wanted the answer so that I could move on. Um, because it was a coding problem. It wasn't a, a conceptual, I'm not understanding the concept. It was just, how do I put this into code? Tell me if my code is right or wrong. <laughs> It was just so, it, and it was so frustrating. It was really frustrating for both me and for the professor. Yeah, I've been in that position myself as both the student and the instructor, and it's frustrating. One thing that I try to um, remind myself and students is that there's usually not one right way to code something. And that part of the process is to like figure out what works best for you or like what your coding style is. And um, 
once you have kind of a foundation of what your coding style is, to me, it goes back to what you were saying, Anna, that it becomes a lot easier to Google things and figure things out for yourself. Um, but as an instructor for um, students who are really new to coding, this has been like a really, really frustrating and challenging experience for me, figuring out the balance between when do I make students like or push students to figure things out for themselves and when do I just give them the answer because it just doesn't seem like it's going to go anywhere if I don't do it. Um, yeah, I have no answer for what that should look like, but I would definitely be open to any advice anyone has, because I don't think that challenge is going away anytime soon. One, one idea for that that worked fairly well in my freshwater ecology class last fall, where which is normally an in-person lab, you know, boats and waders and whatnot, and now we pivoted and they were doing data science projects all fall, um, is that for and for all of them that was they were learning R for the first time um, was having an open forum like through the the black canvas tools and a requirement of before they asked an instructor for help they had to post the question on the forum and there was incentivized kind of participation credit for the students to respond to questions that they found on the forum and that was huge and both kind of normalizing okay this is a really basic error but it seems like everyone else is struggling with this too. So that helped with kind of like making it be okay to ask for help. It really, I think there were some students that were like, it was kind of ridiculous. Well, I mean, it was really impressive that like really took it upon themselves to answer questions that kind of helped build that empowered them. Um, and then that also took enormous amount of work off the instructor's part of having to answer like basic syntax questions. So I don't know if that would work for all classes, but just something that might of, of like making it be the process by which making that be one step of in the process by which they get help and making that explicit could be useful, Alyssa, to answer your question. Kaylin, with your stuff where you had, um, you gave an example where you had, students had to answer questions about it after, um, was, and maybe I'm misunderstanding how it worked, but when you were presenting it, I was thinking, oh, that's really cool. So when like we're having an issue like what I did, you can just give them the answer, but then they actually have to reflect on it and think about it so that you, while you are just giving them the answer to move them through, there's still that um, process that they have to go to to think about it. It's not just copy paste and it leaves my brain because I've copied and pasted it. Have you felt that that helps and that that works or is it totally am I totally applying it to something that it was not meant to be applied to like was it the uh, purpose of that different than than what I'm thinking no I think that fits um we did this so there were certain assignments where that were common for everyone um where they you know that there was the same data set that folks were analyzing but then there were different parts of the assignments where students had their own individual data sets um, where they had to do independent work. I mean, similar types of analyses, but on different data. Um, and I think there was much more reflection when it came to their independent data because they had to actually, they couldn't just take something that was prepared for a script for something else because they had to modify it themselves. So I feel like that balance um, is important because I can see a case where they don't do that reflection with the discussion board forum kind of format. I, I know we're kind of at time, but but one thing that I also found really helpful was um, the Ecology and Evolution Journal did a special issue in that came out last December on resources for online turning online teaching and software. Um, that's like 20 a collection of 20 papers and they did really interesting um, kind of analyses looking at different classrooms that I would recommend for folks um, that on things kind of like saying what you're talking about of like how do you design a group project you know so that you don't have like the butcher the baker the candlestick maker but you can actually have some common learning and then people can specialize and things like that was what i remember one of the papers on so one thing i wanted to follow up with as we're getting close to time um thinking of from as the program manager for FDN, seeing you know the different working groups and the upcoming workshops and um, some proposals that are in the works, it's been really great to have all three of you share with us today um, because it's you know I've, as you were talking about the resources and and what you've gone through, I was thinking about different ways that we could 
um, connect, uh, you know, groups that we're working with in EPI um, to these resources that you've been talking about and thinking about this approach. And so I just, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time today. And um, yeah, I can see lots of connections for the ecological forecasting community. Thanks for coordinating, Jody and Alyssa and Diana. Yes, so, thanks for the opportunity. It's a nice connection to make. And uh, the ecologists are way ahead of the game in terms of quantitative biology, right? In, uh, in CUBES, we went straight to the ecology community because some of the leadership on the project is from ecology, but uh, we're not afraid of the stats and we're not afraid of the coding. Um, and so the, the cell biologists are dragging way behind us. <laughs> but thanks to everyone. I, I, I thank you um, to everyone for coordinating this and Jody and um, Anna and Alisa and Diana and my my co-panelists. I think I, I enjoyed and learned learned a lot from this. So yeah, glad to be here. Yeah, and when Jody gets the recording done, because we did have a smaller audience today, I think it's just getting a busy week. Um, why don't we all make an effort to send it out to our groups or whatever, so that we make sure that it gets a wider um, audience, because I think there were some really important and useful tips and tricks and tools and ideas today. And my other goal, so I'll have the recording, um, and then my other goal is to compile all the resources that you guys have shared. Um, and so we'll make that available on the website for this page. And then uh, that whole thing will be available. So I'll share that with everyone. Thank you. All right, I'll have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone, thanks, thanks for speaking.